Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and we're once again recording with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. And our guest this week is an Emmy and Oscar-winning visual effects and special effects artist and the senior visit, visual effects supervisor and creative director of Industrial Light and Magic. You may have heard of it. Reading this man's list of credits is staggering and overwhelming. But what the hell, we'll take a crack at it. Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Willow, The Abyss, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, War of the Worlds, and Jurassic Park, just to name a few. Among his many achievements was spearheading ILM's move from models and miniatures to CGI for Terminator 2 and helping to usher in a brand new age of computer generated imagery with the CG dinosaurs of Jurassic Park. He's been nominated for 15 Academy Awards, winning nine of them giving him the most Oscars of any living filmmaker. He's also been honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award by his peers in the Visual Effects Society, and he's one of only three special effects artists to receive a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Joining Stan Winston and his longtime friend and hero, Ray Harryhausen. Please welcome to the show one of the most significant figures in the 20th century cinema. And believe it or not, a man who claims he enjoys this very podcast. The legendary Dennis Murin. Hey, thank you so much. Who's that? Yes. Yes. Dennis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's actually true. You listen to the show. I listen to the show. Yes. I've heard, I probably heard at least three quarters or more of the shows. Wow. Jeez. We're That's not easy. You're way, your numbers are way up there now. We're thrilled. Now, we now, didn't believe it was true. We, oh, we were talking. I, I'm came across Equinox on TV. And and at first I thought, well, this is going to be some awful crap and I'll watch yeah. five minutes of it. And I wound up watching the, it's a fun movie. How did that come about? Well, it came about because I had uh, some time between my freshman year and sophomore year in college, summer, right? And I said, let's make a movie. It was like Mickey Rooney, right? And Judy Garland. Literally, that was it. <laughs> and I borrowed the money from my grandfather, who'd put away some money for college, for like if I could get into UC, USC, and I couldn't get into it because of my grades. I took the $3,500 and was, with two or three or four friends, made that movie. All in 16 millimeter. And this is started in 1965, and we finished it in 67. And full of a special effects. It was just a way of getting... Uh, effects out there because I was sort of tired of just neighborhood kids and friends and people in school looking at them. I said, I want everybody to see this work. So you, what do you do? You just make a movie. And uh, it wasn't very good, but it was okay. And it had some good stuff. And I sold it a couple of years later to Jack Harris, who had done the blob and 4D man sure. and all. And he bought it and put another like $40,000 into it, you know, which was eight times that what I put into it or something, fixed the sound up, shot some new scenes. And that's the version you saw that was in the theater. 
Well, you got three fans of that movie right here. I'm going to introduce the third. <laughs> the third one, the, the gentleman sitting to my right, has done this podcast before. Michael Giacchino's here. Hey, Dennis, how yeah. are you? Fine, fine. Good to, uh, great to see, see you. you. Only one Oscar. Just one. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> the man has nine. I know. I know. It's. I'm, You're on your way. He's. He's got. He can start a bowling alley with his. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do we see one behind you? Do we see those behind you, Dennis? Your oh, Oscars? Oh, yeah. I know. On the shelf. You know, no, no. There's a bunch of stuff there, but there's one Oscar up there and one C-3PO. Okay. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> and a lot of Vaders and other things I've got around, but most of the Oscars are like all over the place. And do you have the monster from Equinox up there? I Not up there. It's on the floor. If you oh. want to, I can get it if you want to see it. Really? <laughs> but it's, yeah. uh, we insist. You it's actually have it? Okay, hold on. Yeah. What's left of it? Okay. <laughs> Dennis is fetching the monster from Equinox. <laughs> oh, I see a, a copy of it over there on the shelf. What is that? It looks like the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. from 20,000 Fathoms, yeah. Gilbert, on the shelf. Do you oh, see it? Oh, jeez. This is fantastic. Oh, this is too good. Oh, why aren't we doing this in Dennis's living room? Let's go. Look at this. Wow. Oh, my God. He's holding oh, it up. Oh, boy. Fantastic. Holy cow. <laughs> But I wish we were a visual medium. <laughs> isn't that the other month? What about there was that monster that was like, there's one on the shelf over there, right behind your head. Wait a minute. He just put his phones back on. Say it again, Gil. There's now, now I can hear it. One, there's one right behind you. Right behind you. Which one? Yeah. Okay. Let me see if we can get a clear view of this. Oh, that one, that one, it's like kind of greenish. On the left? The one on the far left? Yeah. Isn't that the... Oh, the, that's the, uh, that was a gift from Ray Harryhausen. That's a, uh, you know, a version that he did of the Emir from Twenty Million Miles Miles to Earth. Yeah, okay. He nice. made, he made a right. few of those, and uh, I've got, I'm lucky enough to have one of them. Can I ask you something about the Equinox monster there? Did, yeah. did, did that have an armature in it? Uh, it does. And what was it? Dave what, is it a ball and socket or wire? What was it? Yeah. There, there's wire on the wings. The body's all armatured. Wow. And, and you so made I, that at, at the no, time? No, no. My friend, my friend Dave Allen made this. He was a couple of years older than me. Very impressive. Now, I, I grew up on the, on the stop action. Yeah. And, and it's still where my heart is. Like, there's something about stop action. I, I remember watching a show where they, they had guests on... And somebody was talking about the new CGI effects, and the guy said, oh, you know, when you look back on those old stop action, all you could think is, thank God for CGI. And that pissed me off. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Be because I, it, it was like that, that to me, it was still, it's still magical to look at stop mm -hmm. action. Well, and, and also, you know what it is, is you can sense that there's an artist behind it trying to make this work. Sure. And yeah. struggling. You can just feel the performance that they're trying to do with this hard, old-fashioned way of doing things. And you, you appreciate it. In computer graphics, you can't tell how it's done. It's so slick and mathematical looking. Yeah. And there was a quote someone said on this show that Roger Ebert, he said that... Um, uh, a uh, CGI looks real but feels phony. Uh, stop action looks phony but feels real. Yeah, feels very emotional. And the whole point of it's emotion. You know, any movie, anything you're doing as a performer, you want to get emotion from the audience. And there's hardly any emotion when you're looking at, you know, some sort of – some. Something, it's too sparse. CG is too sparse and simplified. Although I love it because, you know, if you do it right, but it's hard to do it really right, especially with the demands now, it, uh, it, it was necessary because the audiences did not really buy the old style. And I don't just mean stop motion, I mean all the old style effects. It was really harder and harder to get the stuff to look real. But CG is, uh, because anybody can kind of do it. You know, you can go to any computer store, buy the stuff, buy the... Buy the you know, download the materials off the internet, buy a, a book or training program, do it yourself. It's so it's open to so many more people being able to do it that it's just all over the place. So, I mean, but, you've, but you've, that doesn't mean it's all good. It's it's never the tool. It's how you're using it. Yes, it's and you certainly know how to use it. 
for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> and then some. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's ridiculous. I remember bread. being a kid <laughs> and being completely disappointed, you know, after seeing, being raised on Harryhausen. And then we get to those films where they put the prosthetics on the lizards and had them running around. Yeah. All oh, that. The remember that? Fucking yeah. worse. Yeah. Yes. I remember how that disappointed as a kid I was. me off yes. so much <laughs> when I'm waiting for some stop action dinosaurs and I see like, you know, fucking iguanas yes. with plastic horns on them. <laughs> Yeah, that, and you can you can sort of see how it's being pushed into the scene too, and it doesn't want to go. And, you know? and they said to make matters worse, they had like people with prods that was stabbing them. Oh no, I hope yeah. not. Burning yeah. them and stuff. Yeah, tied together and look like they're fighting, rolling oh, them on yes. the ground. Terrible. Yeah. Well, we're all we're all Harryhausen kids here, and uh, obviously you you just mentioned him. Oh yeah. Dennis mentioned that he had a gift. And he was an important person in your life, Dennis. Yeah, yeah, he was. You know, I was also a big fan of all effects. I mean, I loved the stuff that John Fulton did with Bridges the Tokery and and the Ten Commandments. Not so much the Ten Commandments, actually. But I liked the uh, <laughs> Reigns of Ranchapur and, mm-hmm. the, you know, does that, the Tornado and the Wizard of Oz. I was an effects fan, and I still am. Uh, and, you know, again, it's the emotion. You could look at something, you can see a Ray Harryhausen film and say, oh my gosh, you know, I feel something when I'm looking at it. Yeah. Then you look at your, at your 20th Century Fox Lost World movie where you have lizards and you say, I'm not feeling anything. No. I don't and, care about that. Interesting. That's, that's and I what heard it's about. with that remake of Lost World the, with Claude Rains in it, yeah. that they had asked Willis O'Brien, who was the creator of King Kong, to be part of it. And he was very excited thinking he'd be creating, he'd have more money to work with and create. And, and then they just used his name and threw in fucking lizards. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that, uh, isn't that sad? Imagine how excited he probably got there for a while too. Yeah. It's so unfortunate. Cause he thought he could use his talent yeah. for that, but with more money behind it. Yep. But that's uh, that's showbiz, and you know that's Irwin Allen. He's made uh, you know some real fun movies, but he was always tied on the dollar. Well, he also made the, the story of mankind and had the bright <laughs> idea to to separate the Marx Brothers. Yes, <laughs> which we'll never forgive him for. Yeah, <laughs> Groucho, Chico, Harpo, all in separate scenes. Yeah, that was inspired. That was, oh my! God. But you were a fan of old, and I, I was reading about you, Dennis. You were a fan of the Thief of Baghdad, and and oh and, yeah, and and I guess what the disaster movies of the day were, and just right. and uh, you know event movies. They weren't called tentpole movies then. They were, but they were you like you liked big movies. Yeah, I always, I always did, and I never ever thought I'd be working on them. So this, it, my whole career has been like, where the heck did this come from? Because I was a, I was been doing this since I was like six or seven years old with a still camera, and then I got a movie camera when I was ten, and I had plastic dinosaurs you could buy at a hobby shop, and I built a toy, toy boat or an airplane to blow it up. Of course, everybody did that, but <laughs> I'd do it two or three times and have a ca- movie camera on it. You know, because I and then and then a week later you'd see the film. You got it back from the camera store. Was Rick Baker so it was with exciting. you? Well, you you and Rick Baker no, grew up together. I, no, I got to know Rick later. Okay, uh, when, when I was like about twenty or so. Okay. I'm talking about back when I was you know a, 10 a or kid, 12. a kid in super, working in Super Eight. Problem I had. No, no, eight, eight, eight millimeter before, pre, pre super eight. before yeah. Super Eight. Yeah. If if computerization is done badly, it just looks too shiny and glossy. And it's like, I mean, what I love about stop action is you could put your hand into the screen and touch the thing that's there. Yeah, that's exactly right. You can feel it. It's without, tactile. Without me to, uh, it's real. Well, yeah. and the people but that you are- know, I, I, you know, you can do that sometimes in CG if you get it right, but a lot of people don't see it. I think we've got a lot of, it's a lot of talented computer graphic people that are around now, but they haven't had a chance to really learn the aesthetics. They just, you know, if they, you, you know the technical, they'll hire you. And you work on games, which don't have to be photo real. You work on commercials, that don't have to be photo real. You get into the age, you know, the realm of feature films. They really have not ever had any classes that I know of. I've talked to schools about doing this. Classes about what reality looks like on movie film or on dig, movie digital. Interesting. And the people don't know. They know what they think they know, but you, it's not enough. You, you, you can 
you can learn more. The more you look at something, the more you learn and you realize I just am scratching the surface of all this stuff. What were you going to ask, Mike? Well, I was going to say, it's also about, you know, bringing up Harryhausen again, the idea that he put character into right. those figures. There was a, like, they would stop and scratch their leg or they would do things that we all would do. So it just felt like a real creature walking across that screen. It wasn't mindless. Yeah. Nothing he did was mindless. That's what right. I loved. And it was a, uh, it was also a performing creature as opposed to that lizard from the lost world. Exactly. Where you, you know, just... there was a, you know, there was just the too hot under the lights and thing. I just want to go to sleep. You know? So how so, old were you when you decided to look him up in the phone book and place a call? Dennis. I think I was like 12 or 13 and he lived in Malibu uh -huh. and I was in La Cunada near Pasadena. So he was in the phone book and I managed to get over and see him. My mom drove me two hours across town and he was the nicest guy with his wife and all and invited me in. And, but you know, he never talked about how he did anything ever. Really? He wouldn't, I don't even know if he talked about using rear projection. So oh, you know, interesting. I knew from the people I talked to and all how it was done, but he was really secretive and um, you know, he's a magician. He always just wanted to sort of keep his secrets as long as he could. You he, know, he didn't want to, he didn't want to reveal anything. And he, he was an apprentice of Willis O'Brien, wasn't he? Yeah, correct. Yeah, he was. He, they, they were, uh, you know, Ray took his early, early dinosaur films that he'd done to Willis in like middle of in 1945 or six, just when Obi was starting up with lost or with uh, Joe Young and hired him onto Joe Young right away. So he, he saw something in that, you know, and I don't think he, there was anybody other than Ray that was doing it. You know, there was Obi, you know, 30 years older, 40 years. And then I, everything I've heard, Ray was kind of on his own. I mean, he knew other fans of sci-fi like mm -hmm. Bradbury and Forey Ackerman, but I don't know of any other people that he was actually doing his home movies with, you know, same with Peter Jackson. You look at Peter Jackson's home movies. If you've ever seen those early ones where he never put the puppets into him, it's always just like one person. You know, it's, it's him shooting it. And then somebody, oops, somebody else out there that's, uh, you know, performing to the creature that was never in there. And I think Ray was the same thing. And I was kind of lucky being later on that I had like four or five friends that loved this. And we would gather around and show each other our effect sequences all during the late fifties and sixties. So we weren't really working on our own. We, we encouraged each other. None of us were in the business, but we were encouraging each other. And you had to figure out how to do all of this on your own. Were, were there any publications available? I mean, I when I was a no. kid, there was like Cinefix and things like that. Cinefix, but, yeah, Cinefantastic and yeah. Cinefix. And but for I, when you were doing it, what were you? How were you figuring this out? You know, you just learn it on your own. You see enough in the movies. A lot of the stuff you can just look at and tell. Oh, that's a that's a model mm -hmm. in a in a to in a bathtub. It looks like you know, it's actually some huge tank at Warner Brothers, but it right. looks like a a toy. And you just see enough of that stuff and you say, well, I don't, you know, that's not the right way to do it or whatever. I didn't know why they did it one way or another. I understand now because it's usually economics, but also it's some people don't have a vision and they're not really trying to entertain. They're telling a story. So I will, I need to have, you know, World War II battleship go from, you know, from the right of the screen across to the left because it's about to shoot a tornado. Okay. So they shoot that as like a, a wide view. Somebody else gets in there and says, no, it's dramatic. It's the power. It's about to shoot this thing. I want to see the waves splashing up in front of the ship, you know, and you shoot it from another angle. Well, a lot of people don't know the difference. And, uh, you know, one is emotional and one is telling the story. But in, any director wants every shot to tell the story. And it's just much more important to be able to do that. But you can really see it in the old films. And, and uh, I've made a point of always trying to figure out why I like something, why I like the genie in Thief of Baghdad mm -hmm. and not the giant Cyclops in Ulysses or something like that. Right. You know? Didn't you so, make you know, your own films when you were a kid too, Mike? I, in, all I did was make stop motion uh, films growing <laughs> you, up. You, That's really? all I, oh my really? God. Yeah, I, I don't remember I you telling me that. tons of them, tons of them. I mean, we could sit here for hours and watch. You were a Harryhausen them. kid. I love. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I and yeah. then, of course, when you started working and doing your thing, I was around thirteen or fourteen when ET came out, and then I became obsessed. And I, can I bring it up now? Sure. One of my Go absolute right favorite things that I have ever seen has been the shot where ET is coming up over the hill. He's walking up, and he sees the valley, all the lights in the valley there. That to me was one of the most magical things it I have magical. ever seen in my life, and to this day. When I'm on the 405 and I crest the top of the 405 <laughs> into the valley, I think of that <laughs> shot. And I want you to tell me, tell me everything you can about that shot. <laughs> 
Well, you want me to? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. sure. Right. Yeah. The, the, the I, first I re- thought, of course, let's shoot her for real. Uh, so we go out there, and this is back in 60 or 81, though. Film stocks aren't bright enough to do it. But I really wanted to do it, and we tried it. Then we, and then we can put the E.T. E.T. had to be walking away in that shot, mm-hmm. I think, if that's the one you're thinking of. Yeah. Uh, just after he sees it, you see him walking away. Yep. We could never get the light to do it. So then it ended up being a model, and we didn't have much money on that film, and I made this tiny little model about four feet square, and we just did it, you know, with the wall. That's where the trees, and the background was a paint, like a piece of masonite or glass painted with little holes in there with lights behind it. And we had a little tiny ET made about uh, two inches or no more than that, five inches tall that somebody was just moving down there shooting a little slow motion but you with got, a camera boom, there very was small the scale. Twinkle, the lights were twinkling though. In, in a, yeah, in, they in, were. Very much like it would with the atmosphere. So how, how did you... Yeah, how did you do? You know, that? I'd have to remember. Either it was like really simple, and we had a bunch of like hanging string pieces of film or something with a little fan on it and uh-huh. shooting in slow motion. I mean, it was real simple. So that's you know, and it worked because the, it was so powerful, you know. And then I also really have felt the, the the cameraman part of me thinks that every moment should be like perfect, like you're there, Stephen's there. You know, with the with the cast, the crew, the cameraman, you're ready to shoot, and suddenly everything happens, and the moon changes, and the sign, and it's beautiful, and that's when you shoot. So that's what I try to do: is come up with a better moment, like a magical moment for most of the stuff I do. Well, you did it, and on that that's one. one of those, you know, and it's the it's brightness memorable. and the twinkly, all that sort of stuff. Here, here's something: when they don't do stuff right with special effects, is sometimes when you watch a movie. It looks like the movie stops and it's like, ladies and gentlemen, special effects. <laughs> yes. Like it doesn't go, it doesn't You mean it's fit. not organic, just yeah. seamless part of the story. No. Well, I know, you know why that is? Because they have a storyboard. So they say, we want this, you know, again, we want this ship, this World War II battleship to go from the right across to the left to show that he's about to shoot the tornado. We have to show he's pursuing and that's all the, the effects crew maybe is given. Okay, and they just shoot it. But the storyboard artist may not know what he's trying to do. So they're not thinking as a director. They're not thinking as a filmmaker. That really, and that's so, that happens all the time. It also used to happen because you couldn't really move the camera very often for some effects. You had to keep it still so you could shoot a lot of different elements and put them together. And that's one of the reasons for that sort of static feel that I, you're talking about. I just want to But that always it. drove me crazy. It did? You know, crazy well, doing that. It ruins the whole film. Yeah, it seems like the movie is at a standstill. Right. Well, yeah. that's and that's why the sequence in Temple of Doom works so amazingly well with the mind cards because it keeps moving. The camera's moving. You're alongside you, and you are cutting back and forth through that entire scene between practical set photography and what you did. And and if you could just again, I'm going to ask you to break one thing down a little bit and. At what point did you realize you would have to make a new camera or, or modify a 35 millimeter camera in order to get those shots on the mine car chase? Well, I'd, I'd been over in England. I saw them shooting the, the big loop. They had a circle that was probably 100 feet around that they could shoot the, this, the car going in with the actors in it and everything. And we were just thinking, okay, how long would a shot be when you've got a wider view? And, and it needed to be like, like seven seconds, eight seconds. You want something like that to really feel the energy. And you figure out how big a scale you're going to build something and then how long, how long, you know, the smallest camera you could find and everything. It was too expensive to do it as a model. And we didn't have space at ILM. We, we were really busy at that time on a lot of projects. And there was a back, a back building we had that was probably 75 feet square. And, okay, the only reason that we can't get a seven-second shot in a 75-foot run is that the camera's too big, which was like 10 inches wide. And I said, well, that's silly. Why can't we just do it with a smaller camera and we solve it? And I just, because we had a lot of Nikons we'd been using for lining shots up and everything, I said, maybe we can do it with a Nikon. I don't see why we couldn't. We just have to rip off the back and put a, and take a, um, a movement, they call them, from the a movie a stop motion camera, put it on the back of that and do it one frame at a time. And I got a friend of mine there, Mike Callister, engineered the whole thing and and we did it, and it made a huge difference. And it meant it meant that the the walls of the cave didn't have to be concrete or anything like that. We could do them with aluminum foil. 
So you just, I mean, you're shooting stop motion, right? But you just crinkle the set around from behind till it looks good. Then you spray the color on it and shoot it, and that's it. it sounds simple. Fantastic. But it, I love it. it. Fantastic. It, it's, one of, it's one of those things that, you know, there's a lot of those, you know, being boxed in and having a problem or is, is it to a real advantage because then you learn things and there's a reason why you're, you were tr in the first place to try to solve it. And, and I learned something on, uh, on uh, Empire Strikes Back uh, that I've never forgotten. There was a shot flying over at the beginning of the film, flying over Hoth, and, which is the ice planet, mm -hmm. and you kind of look down and you see a tauntaun and it's running along down there. And it's like, you know, you just think of it, well, that's, I know that. Okay, great. It's, it's Luke or, or I don't know if it's Luke or Han running after, uh, looking for the other one or whatever. And George, the way that start started was George just walked in right near the end of the show and showed me this background plate from a helicopter where you're pushing in over the ice field about 100 feet in the air and you, the camera just tilts down to the ice field. There's, of course, nothing there. And he said, can you put a tauntaun in here with the guy running on it? And I looked at and this is pre-computers, right? No, there's no way with all those camera movements that you can do it and get a stop motion character in there. There's no way. And he said, well, just think about it. Think about it. And I said, okay. And he walked out and within 15 minutes, I'd figured it out. That's fantastic. <laughs> and I just learned the power of like not giving up and thinking about it. There's usually some way to put pieces together to get something that's going to work. Was that optically and printed? It was optically printed, but the trick was getting the the tauntaun, the perspective on the tauntaun to be correct. One, to lock it to the ground so it looked like it was running on the ground, and then getting slightly bigger as you move in. And then as you're supposedly over it, looking down on it, you're now looking down at its head because well, you're like looking down. Well, then how did you do it? Did you just have it's to break it down frame by frame and match that? No, move? no, it, it's the rig. Well, it was always done frame by frame, but it's it's real. there's some talk about it, but it, but... It's uh, it, the, the motion was done on an animation stand and the tauntaun was being held on a rotator. So you could rotate from looking at it in profile to, to looking down at the top. And it's, you know, the animation stand could push in to get closer to it. And we plotted it essentially the same way they used to do all those, you know, all the Tom and Jerry cartoons with Gene Kelly and everything. That right. was all hard work on an animation stand. I just did it in a 3D space instead of in 2D space. Wow. But, you know, it, it took a leap of faith and all, and it took the challenge to do it. And knowing that that shot was better than if I said, oh, let's just do it as a big model and it'll be fine. No, because it's better if it's real. So I, I took the time to think about it. I, just, I want to ask you a question about the problem solving. And this was something we asked you, Mike, when you were on the show. You were trying to solve the problem of that specific piece of music for Up. Uh -huh. And you said it finally came to you in the shower. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, are you just sitting when you need to solve a problem like that? Are you just sitting at the computer and say, and just deter, do you have to walk away? Do you have to go for a walk? Do you have to do some kind of, of other exercise? I mean, how, how does it happen? That you say, oh, that's it, Eureka. I, no, I, you know, there it. are the, there, it can be both. There can be the Eureka moments, but often it's there when you're just trying to figure it out at the moment. But you know, if you can't figure it out, you're still thinking about it. You know, yeah. your subconscious is really working. I mean, that's the, that's the reason all of us, I think are alive. I'm fascinated it with keeps that. It us, keeps us going. Yeah. There, there was a special effect that uh, puzzled people for years. It was finally revealed how they did it. But that was, I mean, I always loved transformation scenes. That was like, and there too, I knew how they did it, but I loved watching it the old time. Yeah. And and that was the transformation scene in Frederick March's um, Jekyll and Hyde. Can you explain how uh, they did that? Yeah, that, uh, that film was in black and white. And what they did was they put, uh, I think it was, red makeup i believe on him and looking at it through a red filter you wouldn't see the makeup and it was like under the eyes and stuff like that to make him look really scary and then they slid the red they had a filter that actually went from red to blue and actually just slid it along it was transparent slid it along or they changed the color on the lights so that when you see him in blue light all that red makeup goes black at that time because it's the opposite so it, there was no cuts, no tray, you know, no lap dissolves, no anything like that. But it only worked in black and white. But it was really great. 
they did a really good job on it. There you go, Gil. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, we were talking to Dennis before we turned the mics on. He's impressed that you managed to book Janet Ann Gallo on the show. Speaking, yes. Speaking of horror films. <laughs> I, I was. <laughs> you know who she is? Yeah. I'll explain to Mike. Yeah, I was crazy about. I, I, I kept saying that was the one I wanted. Janet Ann Gallo. Yes. yes. Because yeah. I remember Ghost of Frankenstein. She was a child actor in Ghost of Frankenstein yeah. with, with, uh, with Cheney Jr. Cheney Jr. and Bela Lugosi. What other show is going right. to book these people, Dennis, I ask you? That's right. I Nobody. Nobody. And and It'll, she she thought nobody. She goes, no one's going to know who I am. She thought we were crazy. And, and I said, on, believe me, <laughs> the people who listen to this show, you're bigger than Julia Roberts. <laughs> well, I don't know. Did I, you guys know who moved across the street from me when I was 14 years old? Tell us. Morris Ankrum. Wow. Wow. You know, Colonel Fielding. Uh, I don't know how many colonels and, and scientists he played in those movies in the 50s, and he was the judge on Perry Mason for yeah. years. But he's in a lot of Harry Osmond films and Burt Gordon movies and everything. Burt I. And, Gordon, still with us. And my mom called me and said, you won't, you won't believe who moved across the street. <laughs> and, uh, and when I met him, I was just shocked. There he was in person. I mean, I lived, we lived in La Cañada, which is only a half hour away, but we might as well have been living on the moon. And uh, as far as who you ever see in the business, you know, you have a fondness. And he had for, two kids that were really, really nice. Yeah, you have a fondness for these obscure character actors that we talk about on this show. You know, a little bit. Yeah. Not, I don't know about the characters, but also the principles. Yeah, and the directors and the production and how it's the package, how it all came together and got done. And yeah, and the you know the the problems they had to solve. Here's no, some I love that. Here's some trivia about Equinox as it relates to our show. If I hope I have this right, that one of the cameramen on Equinox was Ed Begley Jr. True. That's that's <laughs> on the Jack. Oh, man. <laughs> really? That's yes. the Jack Harris version. Yeah, I, I was only out there on that. They only shot for two weeks on his version. Mine was two years, but on his for two <laughs> weeks. And I just saw him out there. I didn't even meet him. But he was tall. Right. You know, thin. <laughs> and uh, you know, had the red hair. Been and on his show. I, had no, I, mean, I remember hearing... Ed Bagley Jr. Oh, wow. Yeah. And now he turns into a terrific comedian. A connection to this podcast. And this is also interesting. And Michael and I were talking before. Somebody else who turns up in Equinox is the legendary Forrest Ackerman. Right. Yeah. He was a friend. Yeah. He was a friend and of mine and Mark McGee, who wrote the script, and Dave Allen, who helped me with the effects and everything. So uh, he used to open his house up and, and we could come by once we could drive we could come by and meet people on like Sundays. The so Acker Mansion. You'd see Ray yeah. I've been there. I, I I did that. I was lucky enough to to, to oh, get yeah. to do that a couple you times. You go too, yeah. Gil. I I I was there twice. Yeah. Oh yeah. And he oh, was yeah. great. Yeah, and I I heard as he he was a little too trusting of people very, with very, invaluable yeah, very stuff. Much. Like he had the dino, the actual dinosaurs. From the original King Kong and yeah. just stuff you can't play. And people would just slip it under their coats and leave with it and everything. Yeah. Were you- well, I remember, you know, I was seeing them in the in the 60s, the early 60s. And between like, you know, 62 or 63 and 65 or 66, I think his collection of still photos, I think he'd lost or, and stolen like a third of them. We're gone. That's it. He, people would just open, you know, he'd open his filing cabinets to incredible photos from these movies, and they just would, people would take them, you know? So later on, they just continued that, you know, with the Kong stuff and so much. Do I have so this, trusting. Do I have this at all right, Dennis? Were you profiled in Famous Monsters in Filmland as a young man? Yeah, you know, because you yeah, were. Yeah, you know, Carrie and David Ankrum, Morris's sons, and I put on this uh, a, a museum in La Cañada. Of because uh, we didn't uh, we were collecting still so I had photos from you know Burt Gordon movies and effects and Frankenstein and all that sort of stuff again wanting people to see him and and they had a back house and and we put on the walls all these photos and posters and everything giant behemoth and stuff yeah and put a big sign out in front of their house on Saturdays and Sundays for people to come and see this so and then forty I told forty about it or wrote him or something I may have been one of the first times I met forty actually. And he came out and showed up there and put it in his magazine. He called it the Murin Museum. But it really was, that was not it. It was the, 
I forget what it was, the Academy of Horror and Science Fiction Museum. Okay. Or something. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> but, but we only had two people ever show up. Oh, for like three oh, weekends only two people we did showed it. up. And famous Come monsters on. used to do that thing of um, wanted more fans like, and they'd have a picture yeah. of a kid. Oh, yeah. And one time, I think it was wanted more fans like little Stevie Spielberg. It could have been, yes. Yeah, he did that with a number of, of friends of mine, other two, yeah. I haven't talked to Steven about it. I don't know about that. That's fascinating. But, yeah. <laughs> so you were a collector, too? Yeah. Yeah. You mu- so you must you got, know. You got to. Yeah, how else are you going to be able to keep those images unless you collect photos of them? You know, you know, they're fleeting, right? They're on TV or they're in the theater, and they're fleeting, and they're gone. So yeah. it was the only way to do it. I used to shoot 8 millimeter off the TV screen. To Make be your able own to version of Destination that. Moon, and no, the, but the real, the real movie on oh, the TV oh, screen. Okay. So I ever, could at least look at it and I study it. As a kid, know? did you ever try and? I mean, you. I grew up in New Jersey, so I was far away from Hollywood. But you were in La Cunata. You could go down into Hollywood. Did you ever try and sneak onto the sets or sneak into any of the studios to see kind of what was going on? You know, I I couldn't ever. You couldn't ever do that, and you're too scared when you're like that young or so. But I had a, a guy across the street. A friend of mine in school, his dad was a was a a doctor at one of the studios, and I went in on the weekend and saw some of the sets. So I'd occasionally see oh, sets. If I was driving around though, and whenever you saw a big truck in, in in L.A., it was a film truck. Right. So I would always stop and watch, and I saw a lot of stuff being done then. I saw all the all the stuff being done at at John Marshall High School there in Los Feliz. They were always shooting a Mr. Novak that series. And oh, with James and Franciscus. And, yeah, you could just drive by, and there they were. And I'd walk up to it, and I'd look, and here's the crew, and here's the actors, and all, and and there's the camera. And I always thought, if I'm just going to do this, I'm going to be by that camera because that's where <laughs> something's going on. That's where everybody <laughs> is focused, and that's where they're making it. You know, it worked out. Did you ever think you'd see a big fancy schmancy Criterion version of Equinox? I mean, it's, <laughs> 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 it's got a real following. <laughs> but, well, you know, it's it's. It's right in my collection, right between uh, Citizen Kane and Grapes of Wrath. I mean, it fits right in there in alphabetical order, you know? How about Close Encounters? What can you talk to about? What about and what was Douglas Trumbull like? Doug was great, a really good artist, you know, really knew how to make things look really super nice and everything and good and a completely different setup from Star Wars. They knew how to do things, but in Star Wars, we were going for speed, on Close Encounters, it was more reflection of Steven and with Doug in there, of course, which was going for for feeling and emotion and and a, you know pictorial beauty in it and and you know all that stuff, which I liked, but I'd never done that before in a big film. So that was a great education for me and you know, a year and a half to go from one show to another. How did you get on Close Encounters? How were you hired on that? Uh I was Wrapping up Star Wars after a year, and uh, I'd heard from somebody there. They, they, everybody knew each other. I didn't know Doug or anybody down there, though. But uh, said, oh, you, you can probably get some work down there on Close Encounters. They're doing something. Uh-huh. And it was down to the other side of town. It was going to be a long drive. And I thought, well, I can put up with it. And fortunately, I did. And got, went down and got the job. Started four days later. And it turns out what, I, what they want me to shoot is the mothership. Oh, wow. And I knew nothing about the script. hadn't heard anything about it. But, you know, what I really, really, I was about ready to get out of the business. And I stayed in a little longer. This is before Star Wars, even, to to meet the directors before I gave up. Is this when you were living with your mom with your maxed out credit cards? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, right. That's it. I'm out of money. $750 in debt. <laughs> and uh, it was a lot of money to me. Uh, and so anyway, I wanted to meet George. That's what pushed me to get on to... And to get unknown territory, right, with all these people I don't know on Star Wars. And the same thing to, to meet Steven for Trumbull, you know, because I didn't know anything about that fancy equipment. You know, you look at Equinox, that's all I knew. You know, wood and sticks and glue and paint and everything. But I was so impressed by 2001 that I said, I wonder how these guys do this. And I knew kind of that Star Wars is going to be done like that. And certainly Close Encounters was, but it was scary going into into those shows, not having a clue as to how the equipment worked or anything. But I was pushed, the directors, I love those directors. Mm -hmm. What were some of the tricks you had to learn when you couldn't uh, have the money for all the computerized stuff? 
What were some of the tricks of just gluing and folding? And- you mean when he made Equinox? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> like with your hands, getting your hands Getting messy your hands, and- well, you know, um, you, you don't have to be perfect. If you try to do something perfect, you'll never get it done. But in the context of a film, you can have some pretty funky things for a few frames here and there, and maybe you cut away. Right. Or maybe you put something really bright over that part of the scene. Or maybe if something falls apart, you put a sound effect in or something like that. You know, there are all sorts of ways to do it. But, um, you know, if you're going to have something break apart, you do it out of plaster or something. You don't make it out of concrete. You know, there are tricks to making things. If you have a a model or a bridge that's going to collapse, you don't necessarily make it. And I did this as a kid. You don't do it out of plaster. You do it out of balsa wood. So it can just break and, you know, paint it to look like a bridge and all. Uh, but, um, you know, you have to know all those tricks because it is all a trick. There's nothing real in it at all. And that's all stuff that, you know, you would have thought when CG came in that I would have really been kind of obsolete. But I, I wasn't obsolete because I learned what looked real and what didn't look real. Mm-hmm. So I could apply that to CG. What looked real and what didn't look real. And at the beginning in, in CG, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, I was going to interrupt you. I've heard you say that you feared technology when you when you when you got into it. Yeah, I was feared it and wasn't really interested in it. Uh huh. You know, I mean, That's it's just kind of there. You, you know, it's, it, I'm interested in the end image. That's all. The end image, how how I feel about it when it's over, and I have a way of seeing it in my head the way I'd like it to be, and it always changes. But if it always gets better, which it seems to with good directors, then I'm fine with that. Well, you, you know well, this show. We, you know, we love to talk about turning points. And just to go back, you 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 said something about getting out of the business. This is after Equinox, right. and then you knocked around this, for a while. Do I have the chronology of this right? You worked on Green Giant commercials, and yeah, the Cascade of California, Cascade, did, uh, <laughs> which is Hillsbury oh. Doughboy. <laughs> yeah, do I have this right? right? Right, right. And you were fed up at a certain point. I was out of money, and, and out just, of money, and, it, and all in L.A. was a union town. And, you know, what's a 22-year-old going to do? How's he ever going to get a job? You know, I... I uh, And there was no industry per se. There was no special yeah. effects industry to go knock on a door. No, there wasn't. Mike there and were I were talking do, about that. Do, yeah. do titles and stuff like that. Right. And, and commercials were about the only place, and that was really just Cascade in, in Hollywood, right on Seward there, uh, right near where Harold uh, Lloyd's first studio was. It's a very famous part I know of that LA, block, yeah. Which I never... I didn't appreciate at the time. So, but anyway, it's, eventually I was ready to get, you know, to get out. And I said, that's it. I'm going to go into inhalation therapy, which I had, had seen, <laughs> I'd seen in an ad in Los Angeles therapy. Times. Yeah, in the LA Times. I think I can learn that, teaching oh. people how to breathe. Wow. And, uh, but then, you know, um, Star Wars, I heard about Star Wars and I just pushed to get on it. So, and managed to find uh, people to talk to out there. And how did uh, how did Star Wars and Lucas show up on your radar? Uh, I was working at Cascade right before Cascade closed up, and we sold the camera. We were like trying to consolidate uh-huh. to somebody who wouldn't say where he was working, but it turned out that he was working on Star Wars, wow. and they were just starting to set up the animation department. And this was an animation camera. And then a couple of friends of mine went out and actually heard an inter- or interview George, or didn't interview, they interviewed with George about working on the show. And they were stop motion guys and, and, and of overall effects guys, really good, Jim Danforth and Bill Taylor. And George said, no, no, I don't want to go this complicated way. I'm gonna, I don't mind throwing the models in front of the camera or sliding them down wires or something. That's the way we're going to do it. We don't have the money. So uh, they went away and I'm friends with them and they told me about it. And I thought, oh, that's just too bad, you know, that but it's never going to work out. And then, of course, I guess everybody else in town said the same sort of thing or said it was Im- impossible, the people that, that they talked to. And then they go with John Dykstra, who comes up with this revolutionary, expensive, time-consuming idea that changed the industry. Mm-hmm. So they ended up having to go with new technology, you know. And so the rest, I, the rest is history. I just followed it. Yeah, the rest is history. And then all that's like sort of obsolete once computers came in. I mean, nobody talks about that motion control stuff anymore and how it really changed the industry. Do you think there's going to be a day when there's going to 
you'll just make movies with no actors and no location shots because it could all be done by computers. Hope they're still composers. <laughs> barely no, are now. No, you know, you can auto compose too. That's all coming. Yep. That's, I think it's probably there based on the color, the scene, or the. Let's hope yeah, not. How do you reason. think I write my scores? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's hope it's not. It's an app on my iPhone. So, anyway, Gil, yes, it is. And it's happening right now, right? And they're animated films. But you're never gonna t- you're never gonna get the personality of the people. You're never gonna get the voice inflections. You're never gonna get the reality. Sure, you can do it. That and that's not the question. The question is, should you do it for certain th- stories? You know, if you're trying to really feel something with people, do you want to look at a fake image, or do you want to look at the real person there? You know, in a relationship that is just breaking your heart. You know, far more than an animated character ever could. What, what is this oh, thing? I, I don't think. I so. saw in an interview with you, Dennis, uh, you were talking about the, the 3D design, adding 3D to 2D movies that you saw a test with Casablanca. Yeah, yeah. I saw Casablanca, Roger Rabbit. Um, Could you tell us a about Marx that? Brothers film. Wow. You know, I forget the company that did it. What, uh, what were they doing real, exactly? What were they what? What were they doing the, exactly? It was a demo reel that they'd put together. And they, they had like two minute scenes from, you know, these big movies that they had added, you know, post 2D, and they're doing it a lot now, you know, or 3D to 2D movies. You see it all the time now, and it's mostly not done right. So it looks pretty bad when you see the 3D, but they they did it to sort of sell the industry on it. And it kind of worked, and people started doing it, you know, and they were really neat. They did it much better than than most of the conversions are being done now. And I I really enjoy 3D if it's done right, but as far as I'm concerned, nobody's doing it right. And I, it's too hard to explain why, but it's uh, I, I did the uh, 2D, 3D conversion on the on episode two and three of Star Wars that have never been shown. They were going to release them and they never did. We showed them at conventions and all, and they're done this different way where everything is much more spatial. You're like looking at a room. You're not like looking at the figure. You're looking at the whole space and seeing people mm-hmm. moving around. And I thought it was really neat. So, uh, but I wish that footage were still around. Because it's neat to see those movies, especially possibly Wizard of Oz. Some of Wizard of Oz in, in 3D. It's been done since. But. i got to see this. Yeah, I know. You, you were I, in yeah, this? I, I, I am aware. Of that. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Now, I remember watching when I saw uh, House of Wax in a theater <laughs> and a couple of other 3D. <laughs> and Blood of Devil. It, oh, yes. Or, or, wasn't that the double feature? Yes. Oh, my God. By a one-eyed director. Yeah, Andre de That's right. <laughs> yeah. and of course. I had so, one eye. So he could never know <laughs> if the 3D know. was working. It's one of the great mysteries of Hollywood. You need two eyes, too. So they, of course, in uh, Hollywood Brilliant, hired a one-eyed director. Right. And... But I remember those early 3D when you'd watch, you'd look at a room or the actors and it's like you could see depth, but you, every figure looked flat. It looked like a pop-up card. It looked like you could go into the room, but that all the actors were cardboard cutouts. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. And that's even true of some of the movies now. They still sort of, they're shot in 3D. Yeah, I agree. What, you think that's part of the future, Dennis? That when it, it, no, it, I, I, I mean eventually, I, but I don't think so. It had a good chance. Uh-huh. A lot of the problems they had in the fifties and sixties, they got rid of with digital. So now there's almost like no excuse because you can see it on the set, and they never used to. And uh, but but I don't think people are thinking about it as much. You know, and it really is the story that is like a trick, but it's yeah. the story is so important. Dennis, what? Did you work at the shop in Van Nuys when you were working yeah. on Star Wars? So can you tell me a little bit about that? Because that is sort of like a pilgrimage that I do once a year. I usually go and oh, drive by. Oh, no, you do. I drive by where that used to be. I, used, I took my kids there when they were young. And we're like, this is important. This building right here. So that, that's where they wow. blew up the Death Star. Where in ILM that, first in that existed? Parking lot. Yeah, wow. exactly. Tell me, tell me about that. What was it like well, there? Well, it was... Uh, it was when I moved, when I started there it was mostly an empty building. The model shop was going. There were some cameras being started. There was the stages were kind of empty and nothing going on yet. And it was like a bunch of like you know hardly anybody over thirty five, and most people about thirty or younger. A lot of people from Long Beach State from the uh, industrial design group that John Dykstra, who was setting it up, had gone to school in and hired friends and friends. So not many film people at all. 
And it didn't really so much matter because uh, it didn't seem like it because George had the ideas and the storyboards are being done and everything. So it was, you know, it was a fun place. And, and I didn't quite fit in because I was too serious about it. And they were, do, they were guys who were like racing cars and motorcycles on the weekends and stuff. <laughs> That's really important. And I really respect it and all, but it wasn't who I was. So I, uh, I didn't have as much fun because I was too worried about how the hell are we going to get this movie done. Right. And we barely did. <laughs> and what <laughs> were some of your but responsibilities it, at that time working on the film? You know, I was called the second cameraman. Richard Edlund was mainly doing a lot of the stuff, but I was shooting in nighttime, shooting as much as I could in the daytime with the second camera. So I shot a lot of the trench, a lot of the uh, the big uh, battle shots that are of the ships flying around. But there was so much that we we you know spread that among ourselves. And George was in there a couple of times a week. He'd fly down from Northern California and stay there for two days and go over all the shots for the rest of the time with us and everything. And we got along really well. George and I did. I think we'd, uh, I think we had a shared vision. That's true of everybody I've worked with. You know, if I've got a shared vision with like, well, it's like, you know, Spielberg comes up and he says, you know, this, this guy in, in uh, AI, we want this alien or this creature at the end of AI. I want him to look like that guy from man from planet X. And I say, wow. yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> now, <laughs> how many people on that set of 200 knew what he was talking about? Oh, Probably I love just that. you. That's it. Yeah, I so love that. You, you know that, you know, and it was the same kind of with George and, you know, with someone with Cameron and those, you know, it's, it's, I enjoy those much more than if the director says, do anything you want. You're the effects guy. I think I know the I, answer. That's, that's too easy. Yeah. I saw him giving you. I, I watched the video today of, of Lucas giving you the uh, the Life Achievement Award too, and he's talking about how you were you were there in the middle of the night, just just sitting around. You must have you you must be nostalgic for those days. I mean, it was it was everything was happening around you. It was yeah. It, it was it, the beginning. Were, you could smell it. You could feel. You could yeah. hear it. You You're know, on the cusp of, of something big. And and what's in the future of special effects? You know, I can't say. It's a secret. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect answer. I have all the answers. I actually have it. It's right. I'm just thinking about it. It's on this piece of paper. But I I can't. You wrote it down. I did. I wrote it down because I I can forget it now. I'm too old. I can forget it. I know the answer to this. You know, who knows? The thing is that it's not up to any of us. It's up to the public. That's interesting. Totally up to the public, what they like and what they don't like. That's what drives everything. We we had Leonard Malton here, and we were talking about, and we hope we don't see this day either. But we were talking about you know the, what we see seems to be the slow demise of movie theaters. Yeah, I, I heard that show. Oh, you and, did. Uh, yeah, okay. along with I mean, I you know, um, wasn't he sort of saying he thinks they're staying on or something? Yeah, I mean, it gave me it gave it gave us hope. I mean, the the Zig obviously it's a different situation in L.A. I mean, I here know. we lost the Ziegfeld, which you know about. Uh, no, you're right. Yeah, there yeah. are there are theaters for billion dollar movies, but for anything else, it's like maybe you know movies that you'd see in every theater is now you'll find like one little art house in the city, and you're lucky to catch it there. Since yeah. I moved back to New York from LA in 2003, I think at least 15 theaters have closed in, I'm sure. in, in Manhattan, and that's what, 15, 15 yeah. years. Well, the other thing is different, that is the length of time a movie stays in the theater. It's yeah. like, it's gone before you know it. You know, when I was a kid, I could see Star Wars 15 times in, in, in six months. You know, it, it was just still playing throughout that entire time. I miss it. Well, that's why, I think that's why the multiplex started. You know, it was all, my memory, it was all in defense of this big fear of, of cable coming in. And you can see any movie, they called it on demand back then. Right. On demand, yeah. you'll be able to see it. You'll pay your money. This is the, like sometime in the 90s or so. I think that's what started multiplexes going so that you could play these movies all the time. You wouldn't, you, maybe it's not on demand, but you'll, within an hour, you'll be able to find it at your, at your Cineplex because yeah. it's playing at two or three theaters. I think that's what kind of started all that. I think know. Michael has a question for you from a fan, oh. Dennis, and he's, he's going to read it. We <laughs> so put, I just we, read this? Yeah, we put this out on social media, and we were bombarded with questions for you. <laughs> okay. So we'll throw a couple of them at you if you don't mind. <laughs> all right, this is sure. from uh, Robert Martin. Robert Martin, wow. For me, this will be up there. <laughs> this will be up there with the Michael Giacchino interview. 
<laughs> Thank you, Robert. Very nice. Uh, looking forward to it. I would please ask to hear some discussion regarding all of his early groundbreaking breaking work with the 1960s Jerry Anderson supercar. Yeah, tell us about I didn't, that. I didn't. I didn't work on it. The you internet, didn't work on it. The internet thinks you did. Yeah, no, no, I don't think it's, I don't know where it came from. That's British, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, there he's you go. He's probably getting me, maybe he's getting mixed up with Brian Johnson. We were impressed. I know. I was, uh, well, no. Robert Martin, we're sorry, but there you have it. Okay. How about this one? Uh, you did You did work on Flesh Gordon. I did, yes. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now I woke up. <laughs> Somebody, Peter Santa Maria wrote this. I just had to share this. How many minutes into the podcast until Gilbert asks Dennis about the Penosaurus monster? <laughs> <laughs> In Flesh Gordon. I'm afraid I wasn't involved with those monsters. I okay. was involved with some of the spaceships. Fair enough. Like that. Would you... Think of doing a uh, sequel and making a more advanced <laughs> penisaurus. No, I don't. Maybe somebody's done that already. I think they did make a sequel to it, didn't they? Maybe so. I don't know. Where was this one? This is this is interesting to us. Bob Burns. Joe Baeza yeah. says, does Dennis have memories of working on the Bob Burns Halloween extravaganzas in the 70s and oh, 80s? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. I see, I see you know Bob we had Bob still. here. You know the show. Yeah, yeah, we talk about it a lot uh, together whenever we see him, you know, and, and we wish he was still doing them. Oh, he's a sweet man. So what was that like? He is. Oh, it was so much fun. You know, there'd be like six or eight people getting together for like four weekends uh, right before Halloween, and Bob would get an idea, we're going to do the thing. <laughs> you know, we're going to build a corridors like you're you're in the ice uh, or the, Ant the Arctic up there, and doorways and we're going to have a guide telling you to be careful and they'll open the one they'll, don't open that door of course and that's the one that'll open up <laughs> oh, what i wouldn't have give, uh, uh, given to, uh, to, been, so to, uh, to those, have been there in those movies you not only saw the movie but had a live theater show with it oh yeah that's a, that's what this was these were live shows like for two or three minutes long based on movies we had a war of the worlds one we did. We did some fiction. A big goomba creature was on the top of Bob's house. We did a, <laughs> a, a, a mad. Uh, I love it. A Jekyll and Hyde kind of character with the with the blue and uh, red light changing, and uh, we did a really exciting one that was very hard to do on based on The Exorcist, where the girl levitated right there in front of your eyes in the in the attic. And then you're sitting there looking at it, but then at the last minute, you know, you get scared and you run out screaming. So it, it always had a punchline, uh -huh. of course. When, God when, bless that When man. they were alive, they were hiring um, Glenn Strange and Beta Lugosi for some of those shows I heard. I, I don't think they were hired, but they would come by. That's great. As, as fans. Yeah, that's great. Maybe, you know, I think um, I've never I don't remember seeing them, but you know, it's so funny walking into Bob's Burns house. You know, one day I remember walking in and there's Doodles Weaver. Wow! What? Oh my God! <laughs> what a great oh name! Yeah. Ah. I didn't know what Bob. A great I didn't name know to bring you up. Doodles Weaver. Well, yeah, yeah, we've known each other for a long time. <laughs> for a lot, of, a lot of people like that. So these guys would show up. You know, they, we'd have the, on the Thing show. Some of the actors would show up that were in the movie in the original. Wow. Oh man! Would, were there to go through the show. So and I don't know how Bob knew everybody, but he did. You know what's so great about Bob is there's no irony. There's nothing camp about it at all. Yes. He loves right. these creatures. Right. Absolutely. And we all do. And the actors. And that's why, that's why we're still here and the other people have gone on to doing uh, situation comedies or something. Who knows what they're, <laughs> they're working on. I think we'll all enjoy this question from Michael Lavaglio. Can Dennis recreate the bicycle scene from E.T. with Gilbert in the basket? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. It's a challenge. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> it wouldn't be very hard either. Think about that. Dennis wor Rob, Rob Martinez says Dennis Dennis worked on Captain EO with Michael Jackson. Does he oh. does he have a story or a, or a memory? Well, I wasn't ever on the set. Oh, okay. And, but. So, but I knew about it because George was producing it and Francis was directing it. So I heard all the stories about it and it was, it was really, it was a very hard shoot. It was the most expensive, you know, per minute movie. I think up till that time that had ever been done in 3d. 
And uh, Victoria Storato, the great cameraman, shot it. And the stuff looked, I saw dailies from it. It looked just amazing and all. But it was a, it was tough because that sort of thing hadn't been done before in 3D or anything with spaceships and everything and analyzing, you know, how big should the spaceship look in 3D coming out in the audience. Sure. There were all sorts of things like that we had to deal with. Sure. What, why did you say, and I think I know the answer to this too, but we'll, our, our fans will enjoy hearing it. Why, why are T2, uh, Terminator 2, and Jurassic Park uh, high points for you? Because for 50 years up till then, or whatever, I don't know if that number's right, I had been you know, struggling, not that long, 40 years, struggling with trying to make things look real, and there was, it was really hard. And I thought reality, as well as performance and you know, and the appropriateness for a movie was so important because the fakery can pull you out of it if, you know. And CG was an opportunity to do something that actually could do it real. And and it was so hard to get through the figuring out how to make CG work. But I think in, uh, after The Abyss, which we only had like 17 shots, that was so successful. I didn't really understand it. I took a year off and I bought a, a textbook uh, on computer graphics. Uh, I think it was 2,000 pages long. Wow. And I had no idea what an algorithm was or anything. And I spent about four months in a local coffee shop up here reading the thing and came away understanding that it's not magic. It, everything is controllable. It's just that it seems to me as though the people don't know where the controls need to be to make it look real. And that's what I was looking for and hoping for. And, and we've been working on it at ILM for years with the computer graphic department. So we were kind of ready to make a big step. And T2 was the really big step. And, and I came up with an ideas for digital compositing. So you no longer saw the mat lines around the, the T2 character or any compositing. And uh, it was just great. And then, But I thought that was going to be the breakthrough film, but nobody could figure out what they were looking at. And then Jurassic came out, which, of course, was the big sure. one that that knocked everybody off and changed everything. You know, you talk about seeing a movie with a with an audience. What, that scene when when Robert Patrick passes through the bars, it, what is it, in the asylum? Yeah. And this is what I miss about seeing movies with audiences, is is the the ooing, the ooing and the eyeing. You knew people had not, or were seeing something they had never seen before. Right. On Isn't a movie screen. And, and, and there's was nothing a moment. wrong. Yeah. There's no flaw. You know, imagine if that had been like, a, you know, as much as you love stop motion, stop motion animated figure or something or in the dark or, you know, that, I just love that. That's the the magician part of me, I guess, likes to show that off. Do you actually do magic? Do you, do you, do you like magic? You know, I did when I was a little kid, like 10 or 12, and I'm not good enough for it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that extrovert. Now with, with films now, another thing that actors will have easier is that they don't need to wear bad toupees or get facelifts <laughs> anymore. <laughs> they, I think there have been whole movies where they put hair on actors uh, through computerization, and they 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 make them look twenty years old. I was looking at Michael Douglas being made younger in the Ant Man flashbacks. Yeah, it's amazing. It's pretty good. Yeah, I must amazing. say. It's pretty damn good. I wanted to hate it, but it looked wonderful. De-aging. Yeah, de-aging. Well, you look at some of the credits, and uh, and one of the big companies that does that work, they they got the second highest effects credit on a big recent movie, and, and they just do de-aging. And you look at it and say, who was it? <laughs> who did they make look ten or twenty years younger? You know, they never say you, you never say who you're what you're doing. And they'll never have business. to do that crappy old age makeup. I know. <laughs> or put the Vaseline yeah, so. on the lens to make it soft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you go back and you look at some of that old age makeup. You look at Dick Smith's work on, oh, on, on Brando and uh, and uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman for Little Big oh, Man. Oh, and it's yeah. pretty impressive. And Still, it holds up. The uh, The yeah. Exorcist and The Exorcist. Because I heard like he Max von Sydow was like forty when he did that. Yeah, and you and after you forget what Brando really looked like, but you look at any of those scenes now where he's in the makeup chair before, while they're applying it, and you just can't believe it's the same guy that's in that movie. You know, in the in uh, Godfather, absolutely. Yeah, because Brando Amazing. was in his forties when he did that. Yeah. All right, let's get to something fun. You playing a Nazi? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> it was my dream. For our listeners no. that don't was... <laughs> know, that's that's Dennis behind the Life magazine. I in, know that was the funniest thing in and, the original uh, they Raiders. Needed, uh, Steven needed to get this other shot showing that somebody was tailing Harrison in the, in a, the tri-motor airplane to go from point A to point B in the story. And uh, they were, I don't know how the word got out, but someone looked at me and said, you're the one. <laughs> And I said, what? Okay, well, we're going to, you got a part in the movie. Like, what? What? Okay. So we did it actually in Richmond, which is only seven miles across the bay from where we were working. But the tri-motor was there and it couldn't fly, but it's where they were storing it. So we went over there. Stephen came up and, the, you know, the whole crew and everything, small crew, and we shot it in a uh, in morning over there. And it was the strangest experience to be on the other side of the camera <laughs> with everybody's looking at you. And you wonder, what, do I look wrong? What am I doing wrong? But they're looking at, you know, the shadow of your nose on your cheek or something like that. Or your hair or head the right, uh, half the right way and stuff like that. Do you have so, more of it, a warmth? But it was pretty neat. Do you have more of a warmth for the Nazis now than you did? <laughs> <laughs> well, Gilbert, you played Hitler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't quite yet. I have to soften up. I don't think I'm ever going to quite have that. No. I, I want to throw. I didn't just, even know I was supposed to be a Nazi. I, mean, they, 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 <laughs> I probably would have said no way. <laughs> How about this question? Uh, this is interesting from my, our friend Mike Herman. Does Dennis think motion capture performers like Andy Circus should be eligible for Academy Award nominations? That's a loaded um, question. That's a loaded question. I think it's. You know, sort of, I don't have an answer for it. I think what they do is so important to get the right attitude and so much of the detail in it. I, it's just different. You know, I think some of the people are thinking about doing like special awards. That may be the way to, to treat that, mm -hmm. you know, but they, it's so important. How about this one from Ray Garten? Dragon Slayer was a big leap forward for Disney. What were some of the groundbreaking effects uh, Dennis pulled off on that movie? Any first? Well, for one thing, a very realistic dragon. Yeah, right, right. I was, uh, well, we, we had a, I had a shocker after Empire Strikes Back that uh, we had a preview and a lot of the cards came back saying people did not like that Tauntaun creature. They thought it looked fake, the two-legged creature running uh -huh. in the, we thought it looked fabulous. So I started questioning my own wisdom. Is the, am I seeing it the way the public was seeing it? And realized, well, maybe I'm not. Maybe we should try something different on Dragon Slayer. I was actually thinking of trying it as rod puppets, you know, with, with puppets, with rods below it and that, as a model, but people would move it in real time. But Phil Tippett said, no, no, let's try it. Let's go beyond that. Let's do it actually with all the motors like we do motion control and do it that way. So it's got a fluidity that's like real and you had never seen that before. All you'd ever seen was the really the Harry Austin sort of stuff. And even the stuff we did did not have the reality of Dragon Slayer. And then I kept it real moody and dark and mysterious and the design of the dragon was terrific and the sets were great and everything so it really worked we were really we we're trying to something you're always trying to top yourself aren't you absolutely whenever i finish something i i in my mind convince myself it's obsolete and i really do that that's it's just like obsolete you know and part of it is that i don't want to do the same thing again i want to do something like different but not just different but better you know and so then you got to figure out well what's better you know where, how do you find that if it hasn't been of done course. before so, right. and where are these nine Oscars uh, scattered, Dennis? Uh, they're all over. <laughs> friends, ask Michael where he uh, keeps his. <laughs> yeah, our friends, uh, family, uh, work a little bit around. They're all over. I mean, I try to get them back every so often so they can talk to each other and ex exchange stories with each other. But Gilbert, we're sitting here with two gentlemen who started in life as little boys making their own movies yeah. in the backyard, <laughs> and now they have Academy Awards. Don't yeah. you? Don't you think there's something wonderful about that? That that really is. That's amazing. Where do you keep yours, Mike? It's in the printer closet. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it in the closet? I don't know. All the, all that stuff's in the printer closet. I I feel like you don't put it on display. I don't know. I just I Jimmy Stewart it's, gave this to his father, you? and he put it in the hardware store window. I feel like my mom would yell at me. Don't. Well, you're bragging. What are you doing? You're bragging. You're going to put that out there, and make people look at that. Jeez, I mean, <laughs> got to put it out. Put it out at least. Here's no, a company question. Comes. A question for both of you. <laughs> Do you often feel like if you are looking at an Academy Award that you won? That you'll get like a little lazy, like, oh, look how good I am. I won that. 
and you won't try as hard. Not if it's in the closet. Well, I think that and, <laughs> That's and, and that might be part of like why my psyche wants it that way is because I, I kind of don't want to look at it. I don't want to be reminded that I won that because I constantly – listen, every time I finish a film, I think I failed and I promise myself I'm going to do better on the next one and I'm going to learn. You know, So I feel like I learn something every time well, and I, if I, that's in my face, I won't. I heard wow, Spielberg oh, no. – when Spielberg directed – the second Jurassic Park, he he felt like he was so pr- he his opinion was that he was so proud of himself for what he achieved with the first one that he didn't feel like he worked hard enough. I I didn't see any of that when I was on the film. I I was the interesting thing in that was when he changed the entire ending to to taking place in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> and that happened very quickly. And wait a minute, we're not going to end it on the island. We're doing something completely different. We're going to like make a King Kong where he's in the streets, the T-Rex is in the streets and everything. I thought that was a really good idea. So I, I never saw any sign that Stephen didn't give it 100%. I ever. mean, he I never I, does. I mean, it might, it's probably just him. Yeah. Like after watching the film, like he's he wants it beyond perfect. Yeah, could be. It's a fascinating. You know, Michael, it's really funny you talk about the Oscar. I had mine for the first year in the drawer. Oh, really? <laughs> in, the, in our bedroom, in the bottom drawer, for the probably the same reasons. I don't deserve this. Right. I don't even think about it. Oh, that's. I funny. feel embarrassed that we didn't give it to everybody who worked on the film. But now you have nine of them. They can't possibly all fit in that drawer. So you got to put them around somewhere. No. That's right. It was when I got three of them that I put them out. Though it took three to do it. That was that's pretty number. amazing. Dennis, <laughs> that's amazing. Dennis, as we wrap up, I just want to ask you about your speech. I watched you uh, re- uh, receive the Life Achievement Award from your peers, your visual, uh, fellow visual effects artists, and you talked about Glacier Park. You talked about this wonderful phenomenon. That you, oh, that you was that, it Yosemite? Uh, Yosemite that, it? Uh, that you experienced yeah. as a kid, and you said that sometimes that's what it feels like when a director asks you to do the impossible. Yeah, it's a great it metaphor. Was, uh, it was what they used to call the firefall. The firefall. Yeah, they don't do up, it anymore. Huh? I forget the mountain up there at, at six, at nine o'clock at night, under where, above where Camp Curry is. That's all still there. They used to dr- push big flaming logs that had fallen down down a two thousand foot cliff. And the fi- and hit rocks below and it would all go out and everything. But they did it every night in the summertime, and I was you know six or eight when I first saw it and it was awesome, just the most amazing thing. And thousands of people would be there every weekend looking at this thing. And then they finally had to stop it because the you know ecologist said, oh, it's not natural and like and they were worried about something or other. I don't know what. So they don't do it anymore. But it was the sense of wonder and seeing that. Uh, something that's impossible is happening. It's not a waterfall. I mean, it only works as a bit Yosemite, right? Where you've got waterfalls in the daytime, and at night you've got fire falling down. Sounds wonderful. It looks like flaming water. And that had a major effect on me, seeing that. Yeah. And it leads me to the question, uh, can, can a guy like you that knows how things work uh, maintain his sense of wonder when you, go, when you walk into that movie theater? Is it hard? <laughs> yeah. It, well, I've got to work on it. I work on it all the time uh, to remind myself I'm a kid. Yeah. And to, you know, bring back stuff, feelings I had when I was a kid. You got to, or else you'll get kind of jaded and and bored. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of excitement when you're, you know, six, eight years old. Same but question really, for you, and Mikey. when you're three years old. Can you can you do that? I mean, you've been in the business so long. You've seen everything. You've been a part of so yeah, much. It, 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 it's, it's like he says. You have to work at it, and you have to force yourself to be, be in a certain mindset. But sometimes it just kind of overcomes you and happens. Like you get lost in a movie. And when that happens, it's really one of the most wonderful feelings. That really, truly makes me feel like a kid again. When, it, when a film really works... And you walk out of there not even thinking about how it was made. You're just amazed at the story. And I love that. Like the worst thing in movies is if you're anything that you notice if you're watching, if you're going, oh, that scene was shot beautifully or the dialogue is so witty or the acting, that means you're not in the movie. All right. You're not lost in it. That's true. Yeah. You still carrying that picture of uh, of Ray Harryhausen around in your wallet? I do. I've got it somewhere. Yeah, I still do have it. Yeah, it's so always, sweet. It's uh, always in my wallet. Isn't that sweet? He carries oh. it. He carries it with him. I carry a picture of Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> <I can't. laughs> 
<laughs> I have a picture of Flesh Gordon. Yeah. Yeah, do you? <laughs> I should. I, I want to direct to our our listeners to check out, and it's on YouTube. Is the Ray Harryhausen 90th birthday celebration? It's so nice and so sweet that he that he lived to see that, and to see all you guys get up there and and make such a big deal out of him because God, he really deserved it. Yeah, he was great, and, and a lot of great people showed up for that. Terry Gilliam, people I didn't even yeah. know, were fans of his showed Amazing. up. You know, it's a it's Peter a great Jackson thing. flew in. God. Yeah, he changed a lot wow. of people's lives. It's a great thing to watch. Well, and I feel like you have too. And I, I just want to thank you personally for you know, as a kid, I never thought I would grow up to write music for movies. I literally. I thought I was going to grow up and do what you're doing. I thought I was going to be doing visual effects because I was so obsessed with that. I love special effects. I love stop motion. Um, and I sort of fell into music, but my heart is ha- is still hugely into what you do. And I just want to thank you for all the inspiration yeah, oh, you've thanks. given me. Thanks very much. Yeah, we all thanks owe you much. a debt, Dennis. So Well, thanks. I uh, was in the right place at the right time with the right brain or right mix-up brain. I don't know what it is. I, you know, we've interviewed, <laughs> Something going on there. We've interviewed 250 people now in this show, and so often <laughs> it comes up, you know, I was going to leave the business. I had one foot out the door. <laughs> I was fed up. I was down to my last $48. And it's, it's, it's just wonderful. It's wonderful how things change, you know, yeah. when you love what you love and you, 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 you stay to it. You stay stubborn. Yeah, you stay stubborn, right? And yeah. you got to, you know, you got to be good at it. So when these times come, you're you do them and you deliver. But a lot of, I think a lot of people get out that maybe should have stuck around. Yeah, my friend Susie Essman says, just stay on the bus. What's next for you? Yeah, right. Are you, you writing a book, Dennis? You, you, I rumors yeah, that you're writing my, a book. My wife and I, mainly my wife at the moment, writing a book on sort of on uh, on. It's not a, a memoir, but it's more about an art book on how to visualize things and then how to. Uh, how to bring the emotion out of something in, in effects, or it can actually be in anything. It can be in any art form. And it's because a lot of, like I said, a lot of folks I know that are coming up uh, aren't even taught about, you know, about feeling. Oh, excuse me here. They aren't, they aren't even talk, talking about, you know, doing quality sound, or, or whether, I don't mean sound, but doing quality, um, um, try, to try to engage an audience emotionally. They are just taught the technical side of it. And that's something that that we're try- I'm trying to encourage. We're trying to encourage in this book to get people to to view things as a child and the whatever they're working on, music, art, whatever it is, stir your own emotions up, not just deliver what you think you want to tell, but actually feel it. Wow. Wow. That's does it have a title yet? No, not yet. Okay. Great. But you know, you know that you know that there was that the, there's that school, the master's school or something. that's on the internet that a lot of people are talking oh, about. Oh, master class, yeah, master class. Well, yeah. I saw I saw an ad for Carlos Santana's, and he says exactly the same thing. The preview, it's ex- just like him. Might as well be talking about visual effects. He's talking about music. You know, everybody. Right. I think all of us that are in this feel. You've got. You want to feel it. We want to feel what we're what we're doing, and, and be that's a- not taught in schools. Yeah. And be original. What's coming up for you, Mr. Yeah. Giacchino? Uh, I got uh, Spider-Man coming up. You are scoring Spider-Man. Spider-Man 2, Far From Home. Mm-hmm. Or Spider-Man Far From Home. Mm-hmm. Um, and some other things you can't talk about. There's always things you can't talk about. You know, <laughs> right. Dennis, I'm sure, is way more in- entrenched in that than I am. But, so incredible, but, too. I can't talk it. about this. Yes. <laughs> he can't talk. The secret that you <laughs> asked him, Gilbert, he can't talk about. Yes. Talk about it, <laughs> so, so what fucking good are you as a guest? <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, this might, this might be one of my new favorite episodes, so thank you so much. And, and well, thanks thank for you listening guys. to the it's show. Pleasure. We're tremendously flattered. Well, I'm flattered to be asked. I love you guys. Keep it up. Thank you. Well, this has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre and Michael. I still don't know how to pronounce your fucking name. Giacchino. Giacchino. Kind of Italian. Giacchino. You got it. (laughs) (laughs) And our main guest, a special effects wizard, and that's Dennis Muren. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Thank Dennis. you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Work, work on that ET with Gilbert in the basket. That's right, yeah. <laughs>